All right, Lord, thank you for every day that you give to us. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we get to grow and learn and explore. And even though we don't know things exhaustively or perfectly, it doesn't mean that we don't get to continue to discover and journey with you and enlarge our borders of how amazing you are. And, uh, and Lord, the way you made the body um, to connect to the way that life works has been a new fascinating um, adventure for me and my wife in recent months. And so uh, guide our thoughts and our conversation. We know that you're already in us and with us and present around us. And so enliven us and quicken our spirits. We pray for Dr. Jim Wilder and for his wife and for their work and ministry and continue, Lord, to provide every uh, resource for them and protect them from the enemy schemes. And for every ministry and individual that's represented, may this next hour and 15 minutes and the resources that we are introduced to uh, further uh, uh, your work and your kingdom as a result. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, Dr. Jim, has, uh, as I've mentioned before, my wife was listening to a webinar with uh, Marcus Warner, and I was just uh, sort of making my way across the house where she was listening in to your talking, and you used the word volunteerism, and this was just in late July or early August, and it caught my attention. It's a word that I had taught on and thought about in terms of theological method in the past and had had interest in the ways in which um, preaching in particular is done and, and my desire for greater levels of creativity uh, moving beyond simply a lecture format and into what I would have called Christian education principles or do call Christian education principles about the way that people actually uh, learn. Uh, but you use the word and I don't hear it used often and so you sort of went off on that for a while, and as a result of that, for the last uh, six weeks or so, between the books I purchased and a couple that Michael Sullivan uh, sent to me and some other writings that he has done, uh, you've sort of, uh, yeah, you've been, you've, you've been appropriately overwhelming me and introducing me to something that's not uh, familiar to me, and that is uh, at the levels that I wish it were, and that is my right brain and, and how we learn and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let me uh, start, if I may, I have like three subjects to get us kicked off. One is volunteerism. Uh, two is sort of your journey with Dallas Willard, et cetera. And then I want to launch into the right brain. So let's just work in that order. Talk for a bit about volunteerism and your critique of it. Well, um, one of the things that um, became pretty obvious to me, because uh, I grew up as a missionary kid uh, in South America, and we had a mission that was uh, a mixture of different um, uh, evangelical groups. We had a lot of Mennonites, Presbyterians, and Baptists in the mix. And uh, uh, then when we come back to the United States, we'd travel all around to visit all different kinds of churches. And I realized that, uh, you know, people didn't uh, agree about a whole lot of different things. And there was a lot of divisions uh, between churches over, uh, you know, very small details. Uh, at one point, my father was prohibited of, from... Uh, teaching any theology or preaching because he wasn't quite sure about the nature of the uh, uh, rapture. Was it uh, mid or post uh, pre-trib or, you know, some of those things he wasn't sure the scripture was right. So as I'm listening to Christians, um, I also noticed that very often when they were being right, um, they forgot to be loving. And so in the middle of this discussion, that was sort of the the cultural background. My brother decided he wanted to get a PhD in philosophy and he his interest was also in history and medieval studies. So uh, he really started looking into how was it that uh, we got so focused on um, 
right and choice um that then you know comes back to the psychology work that i was doing when i realized that uh, you know making better choices sounded like a really good idea but a lot of people couldn't make it work in fact the more uh trauma they'd had the less it worked for them uh, so you might say the people who most needed to make best choices their brain wasn't allowing them to do that very well so these are the the puzzles that take us back into um, how it was that Christianity got involved uh, so much in in right thinking, and that started with the Enlightenment. With uh, I think, therefore I am, uh, making thinking the most valuable part of the brain. That's rationalism there, and then pretty soon that followed with, well, it doesn't really matter what you think if you don't make better choices, which is volunteerism, making the best choices. And it's really quite interesting. The will, which is the center of, you know, will and choice, uh, has a very long history with the Greeks and with Christianity. But uh, for almost all of that history, uh, the will of God, you know, God's will and choice has been the entire subject matter. You know, what what does God choose and, and how do we fit with that? But with the uh, advance of the Romantic period, right about the time the uh, U.S. was getting started, human choices suddenly became very popular and they just moved into um, theology almost unnoticed. And that was uh, you know, with the pilgrims, volunteerism was their main uh, choice. Uh, a point was, you know, you have to choose to do the right things. And that was a political issue because in England at the time, as long as you had the right beliefs, it didn't really matter how you acted and you could run for office because you had to be a, a, you know, church member to run for office. So uh, there was a very strong political movement that said, well, forget this stuff about behavior. Uh, and having to act like a Christian, as long as I sign the right document that says I believe the right things, shouldn't I be allowed to be a good church member? And so it was really began this a political fight about character that forced that into the center of the American thought. And since then, volunteerism has taken over American thought to such an extent that uh, many people uh, consider that's just the way that Christians are. They don't see that as a uh, philosophical move that's basically about as old as the U.S. Uh, but it's very different ways to read the Bible if you get outside the U.S. Uh, Western culture, which involved much more with how is our relationship with God? You know, how do we connect with him? How do we love him? How do we interact with him? Um, rather than just what kind of choices do I make? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I want to talk about next Dallas Willard and his wife Jane and so some about your relationship with them and the story about the counseling um, center and you know what was happening down there that was uh, some years ago the work that you all were doing but I, I, I want that to sort of segue into back into volunteerism by by letting me hear from you about the corrections that you were bringing to what Dallas's work was promoting that he was about the will that he was he was adopting um in his and then eventually in his death that that he invited you and wanted you to continue okay you get that yeah yeah I'll 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 try to follow that arc for you right there yeah. um the um, one of the first people I had as a supervisor when I started my at working at the counseling center at Shepherd's House, which eventually became Life Model Works, was Jane Willard. And her husband, um, I was told, was a philosophy professor over at USC. Some uh, I could never we could remember his name exactly. It was some city from Texas. Uh, and what year are we talking about? Huh? What year? This would be 1977. And you finished your studies, your, your Fuller Seminary, and then your mm -hmm. PhD studies by this point? Well, actually, I had my, um, uh, most of my coursework done, but 
part of the school was you moved over and did a, a traineeship, an inter internship someplace. So I wasn't even finished with school yet at that point. I was still, um, you know, professional diapers right there, uh, yeah. getting trained how to deal with people. So this is very early in my training. And uh, uh, it was a, a year or two, uh, let's see, probably about 19... Uh, 80, 81, that I finally finished all my schooling and, and went back to that. So uh, right from the start, she was one of the people shaping uh, my my training and thought. One day she came to me and said, you know, um, I don't know if I should tell you this because you're a psychologist and all, but down in my office, uh, we're inviting Jesus to come in and he's healing people. And actually, that's what I'd gone to school to try to find out about. Uh, but the, didn't learn a lot about that anywhere along the way in school. So I said, yeah, that I not only am I delighted you told me, but I want to know everything about that. And that was, uh, to to some extent, the, the start of the development of a life model, because um, where there really must be some way in which Jesus showing up and healing people fits with uh, how the brain and the body and all the rest of things is created. And so um, on my end, I'm trying to figure out the brain side of it and uh, the biology and, and how does this fit with the way the brain learns? Because uh, learning is the main thing we like about the brain. And meanwhile, Dallas is developing on the other side of things, um, um, some a better alternative to uh, the way Christianity is usually practiced. And so he was moving into the spiritual disciplines and saying, really, you know, we really must train ourselves to do something. So he's looking at how to train the brain, um, not really focusing particularly on the brain, but on what the spiritual practices are the, and practical practices that help us train. And I'm trying to figure out how to train the brain. And uh, Jane's right in the middle. And so as she's talking to both of us, uh, she's realizing that the people who've had a lot of trauma are not doing very well with the spiritual disciplines. And I'm realizing the people who had a lot of trauma are not doing real well at uh, incorporating all the Christian principles. I mean, I used to say to myself, you know, these people pay me a lot of money to come here each week and get advice and then they ignore it the entire week. And Dallas was pretty much saying the same thing about the church. People love to read my books, but they don't practice what I tell them. Uh, so we've come down to this very practical thing. You know, we've got these great ideas. We've even got some good practices. But why is it that so few people uh, actually can use them well? Um, and and to say, to be fair about it, uh, most people got some benefit from it. But after a while they begin to think you know i'm just if this is going really slowly i'm not getting all the transformation i wish i was getting uh, from these practices so that's um that's where we begin to work together and so at 19 no, let's see it's 2011 i guess um i said to dallas you know um the the thing we're trying to create is maturity on both uh, your part and my part. Uh, but there's this great divide. Um, most people, when I ask them, what is spiritual maturity? They say, well, you know, that means you pray, you go to church on Sunday, you read your Bible. Um, and um, yeah, it's pretty much what I learned in, in a Sunday school uh, before I even started, you know, regular school, you know, you just, uh, do these practices. And if you do them regularly, you must be spiritually mature. Uh, and then we looked at people's emotional relational capacity. We had a whole different standard, you know, you had to be, uh, you know, lovingly interacting with people and sustaining relationships across the lifespan and having a well-formed identity that, uh, you know, in some way reflected the character of Jesus. Um, concepts that were not very well woven into most people's idea of spiritual maturity. So we, we had this conference, you know, to say, how do they overlap? 
how do they fit together? And both Dallas and I agreed that, um, you know, the uh, natural human maturity was all included in, under spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity was not something different. It was natural maturity plus something else that we didn't come by naturally. So everything it meant to be a normal human being, a healthy human being, was part of spiritual maturity. And then we added something else to it, which was how to uh, show the character of Christ. And primarily uh, that comes down to how well we love our enemies. That's another area that Dallas and I agreed about. So for Dallas, it was sort of a benchmark. That's how you me measure spiritual maturity. Do you spontaneously love your enemies? And for me, it was sort of a training tool because I found that any place that people's character was actually changing it was because they were practicing loving their enemies uh, so it was a uh, you know the workout plan for christians and uh, uh, not just the measurement of you know if you were spiritual enough eventually you'd suddenly start loving your enemies uh, so those are those are the big areas of, of uh, overlap uh, but then when dallas talks you know he's a philosopher and philosophy uh, and theology have overlapped since uh, the base Greek philosophy since the first century. And um, in the first century and even before, um, Greek philosophy divided human beings up according to faculties. So you had a faculty of the will, you had a faculty of memory, you had a faculty of uh, um, emotions, you had a faculty uh, for every characteristic or ability that people had, uh, you know, the Greeks had a faculty that went with it. And the Christians early on said, well, uh, how does this fit with scripture? And so they put the heart and the soul and the uh, body and things like that. They tried to fit them into a faculty model. Um, now for at least 500 years, uh, everyone knows the faculty model doesn't work because the main, you know, the most obvious problem is for every faculty uh, to be able to actually operate, it has to have its own will, you know, be able to have choices. And so if the will is separate from everybody and they, you know, you, you just couldn't separate the model just doesn't breaks down when you try to use it. Uh, but uh, also, uh, theologians have been very reluctant to pick anybody else's model. So, you know, you didn't want to uh, pick Freud and say, oh, well, we'll make him the center for theology or anyone else that had come along. And, and since philosophers were the ones that were basically carving up human beings into, you know, the different working parts, um, the whole Reformation thing uh, said, you know, which part of the body, which, which part of the human being is capable of, of being saved? And the conclusion was, well, it would have to be the will. And uh, so since the will was the part that got saved and the emotions looked like, uh, you know, every time you depend on them, you end up back in sin. So they're sort of unsavable. Um, you know, these are sort of the creation, the problem that comes from that language or that model. Uh, the whole faculty model. So while no one really believes it works, it's been the center for theology right up until the present. And Dallas uh, used the faculty model for describing human beings. So you'll see him breaking down the human beings, the will is in the center and the, the you know, this sort of standard uh, since Thomas Aquinas kind of uh, model for uh, how human beings work. It just doesn't match the way the brain works. And from my perspective, that's non-essential uh, until, maybe it doesn't really matter, until you actually want to train people to be Christian using the way the brain learns. Then you have to give up the faculty model. Well, Dallas and I were starting to talk about that because center to the, how the brain works is attachments. Who you love matters more to your brain than what you believe. So Dallas encouraged me to start looking into that. He actually set up 
the possibility that we would spend a year researching this together through Biola Talbot, um, as they had a grant for that sort of thing. But then he took sick and had to uh, uh, drop out of the that project. And um, I sort of was left to carry on alone, and that's where the book ended up. Uh, you know, I never had a chance to really discuss these things with him, but. He was very moved by the idea that perhaps salvation was all about a new attachment um, to God that would yeah. actually transform you and not about just a choice that, you know, to believe certain things. Not that the choice to believe certain things isn't very important. Right. It's just not the main driver. It's not the engine that drives transformation. And uh, so that's... Uh, so how do they do it? Covering your your arc of a story there. Yeah. So 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 the paradigm shifter for me and the introduction that you've made, and the uh, again I, I like I like how uh, you you're saying we've got to emphasize this without subtracting that. So it's not that you were saying, hey, curriculum to a small group matters. But in our literate slash Western society, we, we're driving curriculum and content and even the salvation message uh, to say it's more than a ticket to heaven. It's more than just the verses that we memorize. But without subtracting that, you, you, you've rocked my world um, by this idea that I am being profoundly shaped by the people that I identify with. Now, all of a sudden it starts, and I'm just make, I've been making a list of all the places this touches, like in the Old Testament where we are a people of God. And so I'm identified with that greater people of God. You, you say in one of your books, and this is radical, um, therapeutic counseling teaches don't attach to the, to the mentee, to the counselee, and you're like, I had to repent of that because I had to bring my whole self into it. And that's all kind of, you know, God help you with uh, navigating that with uh, your, your uh, therapeutic counseling friends. But it resonates deeply. It affects all kinds of missiology, like, like the oral hermeneutics book that you introduced me to, where they're like, I tried to teach this uh, Western thinking, but... You know, the context is really wrapped around narrative and story, et cetera. And so it's at the same time in discipleship, it's giving this permission to, to say, hey, what if we gathered and we asked, who do we want to be? What's your story? What's my story? And again, without minimizing the importance of our dogma, doctrine, uh, scripture, memory, memorization, you're saying, Things like, um, we are a people who, and as a family, you forgot who you are. And all of it is, uh, yeah, so all that with a setup to say that and, the, and talk to me about this right brain reality that's working faster than the left brain. So jump off there wherever you want to, to, to let me hear from you about those things. Um. The, yeah, just to go back to the distinction, it turns out that the, the left brain, which is focused and has words and uh, analysis and concept, and, and that's where we've put most of our Christianity, is basically by design a problem solver. It looks, uh, gets really focused down on figuring out what a problem is and what's going wrong. It's not the driver of change. It's sort of an error detection system. So uh, the first thing that Jesus comes, he's announcing, you know, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. His first notice uh, is a verbal message to the left hemisphere that you have missed it and you have to, let's have a look at the error that we're making. But then when it comes to transformation, he tells the disciples in the upper room from this point on the the Father and I will only reveal ourselves to those who love us. So the, the center of connecting with God and transforming uh, is 
uh, this loving attachment with God, that fits the way the brain works. So the force for transformation is not finding the error. But on the other hand, you won't know that you need some transformation if you don't see the error. So the two go together very much. You, uh, every time we, we run into trouble, and really that's what Dallas and I were doing, we we're saying, you know what? We're trying these things and they're not working as well as they should. Let's just say we had about 75% success rate. 25% of the people who uh, you know, really were struggling couldn't make the system work. And so you look at that and go, you know, this is, there's something wrong here. That's when you need uh, an error correction because you look at scripture and says, the kingdom of God doesn't say it should only work for 75% of people. This is something supposed to work for everybody. Uh, this is, you know, so if, if it's not working, the left hemisphere needs to go to work figuring out why, uh, you know, what, what's wrong here. But uh, it doesn't have the power to, to build what we really need to motivate ourselves, which is a, a loving attachment. To it. And um, so that, to me, that's how the two of them fit together. Now, you had a follow-up question to that, which I've forgotten. So I want to go back to that. Yeah, well, the, the question then becomes the, ways that the, the way at a practical level, the way this works is I find myself thinking, you know what, I'm formed when I'm sitting with, for instance, my small group of pastor friends, and the curriculum is things like, how, how, how's your week been? And then this kind of, not, not this accountability per se, like, you know, did you sin, et cetera, et cetera, but it's, but, but again, you brought, you brought words to it and the words become an exercises that you and the team that you're working with, the other half of the church, et cetera, that you and the team are saying, yeah, and while you're doing that, let me help you form the words to ask, where was it hard to see Jesus this week? Or where is God at work? Or it would be something as, uh, again, it sounds almost so duh to say, but it's something like, did you make anybody your enemy, including yourself this week? Or when did you, when did you lose attachment or shut down your relational circuits on your spouse this past week? I mean, this kind of thing is just messing with me in a pretty significant way to say, um, wow, what if I brought increased attention to my relationships and to the, the people, the group that I want to identify with. Um, yeah, and I hadn't even hinted at things like you attach the people who feed you. So what if we gave each other communion or how important it is th that we sing to one another and on and on and on. So I still want to kind of, I want to bottom line, that's what I'm experiencing with it. But at the same time, uh, I want you to also throw in the neurotheology piece, the neuro piece, which is uh, keep coming back to, and we know this about the way the right brain works, that the body and the way, Rod, you experience that, uh, have this synchronization that a post-enlightenment uh, Christianity is missed out on. And Dallas was excited about it. And I'm hoping Michael Sullivan, who's going to speak to us in a bit, he's excited about it. There's a team of people who are coming to realize that relationships are critical in our Christian formation. Well, that's a, a really good overview. And like you say, it's, it sets me up nicely to talk about the, the detail. And I think probably there are two bits of the detail that we want to um, to pay attention to. And, and the first is that the human brain comes pre-tuned to look for somebody uh, who will teach me how to live. It's looking for, uh, you know, when babies are born, they don't have speech, they don't have lots of things, among other things, they don't really know how to understand what other people are thinking. And uh, you know, the thing that we discovered is people who are traumatized have not really learned how other people think. And so therefore it becomes very, very difficult for them to understand how God thinks because all the models that they've been following have got followed up thinking. So 
um, you know, one of the um, groups that we served were the children uh, of whose parents were criminally insane. They were locked up in the uh, criminally insane facilities in California. And they came in and they're trying to figure out how people think because they learned from copying the model brains that were that raised them and those brains were a horrendous mess you know they were not only criminal but they're also quite well insane uh, so if you try to make sense of that and then you say well now how does this help me understand god you you've just got a, a complete mess inside so how are we going to straighten up a mess like that well the question is, um, can God also be one of those faces that looks at us because the right brain runs faster than conscious thought, so it doesn't depend on words. In fact, the right brain is uh, like three quarters of the way grown by the time that we're 16 months old and we have a working vocabulary of about 200 words. So most of its shaping and forming and, and, and how it organizes itself is simply in response to how other people see me and respond to me. So we've got this, these mirror neurons, they're called, waiting to, to be seen and activated. So now suppose that God put more in there than uh, what human beings see. There's more to us than what a human being sees. And the people who can see us with God's eyes can see more in us than we could see in ourselves or than other human beings could, could see. Well, we need to be in some kind of community which is in the process of going for a, having a second look. Um, so I would look at these children of the criminally insane. I said, well, God neither, neither intended you to be a criminal nor to be insane. Uh, maybe that's what your brain has been copying up until now, but God really has a better plan for you than that. So let me go ahead and help you find it. And of course they would say, well, you know, no one's seen anything like that before in there. All people see when they look in, at me is that, you know, I'm trash and I'm the child of trash. Um, but can that be right? Is that what'll be the truth 500 years from now for us in eternity if we follow God's way? And the answer is, no, you can make that kind of a, a mess out of anybody if you start young enough, but um, that's not what's going to be permanent. So this community that gathers around saying, let us practice looking at each other, not according to the flesh, even though in the past we used to think of Jesus that way, says the apostle, but we see each other according to the spirit. We see in each other what the characteristics that Christ is trying to grow and when we see those, we encourage them, we resonate with them, we um, give images of them, we give examples of them. If, if you forget, as a people, we come back and go and say, you know, uh, yeah, uh, well, you certainly learned how to malfunction uh, in that area, but uh, that's not how the people of God are. So let's give you some better examples. And this happens when we share other people's suffering and hard times with them. Um, but the way the brain is, I'm not going to let you share my hard times if I don't think that you basically like me, if there's no joy in being together. And so again, we go back to this basic thing that while our brains were still enemies of God and each other, uh, God sees in us his children and begins to love us and respond to us before uh, we're able to even see that in ourselves. He's calling something into being, and the brain was designed for just that kind of a process with the people we attach to, not with the people who are right all the time or have the right answers. Although, uh, if they can show us the truth, we might have a reason to listen to them, but we don't really change until we experience uh, their love and God's love. And St. John says, you know, you can't love your brother who you can see. How are you going to love God who you can't see? So the, the brain yeah. has a, a problem it's got to solve. It's got to practice this with people. Now let me jump in uh, real quick, just again, to sort of formulate what I said earlier. So this is an application, and there, there are others. But one is, is that our small group is going together, or a small group is going together. 
first of all, there's a practice of me getting joy on. Um, what you say is I think about places I practice for five minutes twice a day uh, the joy factor. And we, we'll, we'll just leave that as a teaser for people to read the book. But, but I find myself in a place in which I'm able to see the way Jesus sees me and the joy he has. Then I'm prepared for, to now come to my small group and I give them a reflection of Jesus' face and the way Jesus sees them out of my joy attachment place. So we're mindful of that. And then we each begin to sort of sit with each other in our stories of both our past and our week. And in the midst of that story, I'm, I'm being shaped by the kind of people that I want to be. And therefore, my default becomes how we as a people act rather than simply in what I choose. And now we begin to ask the question, and who, who are the enemies that I'm facing in the challenges of my life that, that Jesus is inviting me instead to love the way he loves them? And it doesn't mean that I won't confront, doesn't mean that I won't, uh, like your other book, deal with the Pandora's problem of the narcissist in the system, and all those things get confronted, but it comes from a place of deep, deep abiding relationship uh, and, and awareness of the right brain. And then with that, it's, it's and the content that we may be, the book we want to read together, the scripture that we want to memorize, etc. Did I, am I getting it? Am I picking up what you're laying down pretty much? I would say yes. It's um, exactly the, the message that uh, I'm trying to uh, sort out of, uh, you know, all the things that I've, I've watched. And, and it does come down to that kind of conclusion. Um, basically, when you form an attachment to somebody, your mind begins to want to think with that other person. So if we form an attachment with God, our mind wants to begin to think with God. What does the person I care about or love uh, think about this? And, you know, that's um, what happens, uh, you know, when I met my wife, we you know, uh, start a relationship, I begin to think about what is it that she likes? What does she, you know, she's got a birthday coming up next month and it's causing me a little consternation because I got to think of what is it that she likes that she doesn't actually have and how is that going to fit? And the better I understand her, the better the outcome will be of that particular puzzle solving. You know, we all know about this, right? But if we have this connection with God, uh, that means that every time our brain is stable, it's running the way it should, our brain is caring about how the people we love will see what's going on right now. That's our, our rep point of reference. Our first reaction to things becomes, um, you know, here's, here's how the people I care about would, would uh, think or respond. You know, my mother died um, 20 years ago but I still in my mind occasionally hear her comment on something I'm doing that she doesn't approve of. Uh, Cause you know, this attachment is there. It's in my mind. It's it, that response comes out before I even have a chance to think about it. And it can go the other way too. I mean, we can all say, you know, I, I, I was said I'd never going to do or say that. And it just, you know, here's the, here was the event and my dad just came out of my mouth, you know, that kind of a, response. It's, it's, these are the attachments we have that form our identity. And so as a, as a group, when we have an attachment, uh, it becomes our immediate and healthy response to think how they would respond to it. Now, when, if God's our reference and, and he loves all humanity, um, every time our brain malfunctions significantly, we are going to respond to other people as though they're a problem and an enemy and something other than someone that God loves. And it's a good sign. We've just lost our connection with our dad because he wouldn't respond this way. So as a community, if we go back and review our weeks then and see, you know, well, when during this week, did you forget uh, who you were and where God was? Uh, 
you know, looking at the people that felt like an enemy, and, and of course, we're such nice Americans, most of us, that we, you know, we don't have any enemies. But really, think about when you felt like somebody was a problem more than a, you know, an asset. Like, it's like, yeah, they're not really on my side, is how we would think about it. And all of a sudden, most of life, for most people, turns into be sort of an enemy mode way of kind of thinking. It's kind of me against them. It's not us together. It's not us finding God together. So if we took those moments and reviewed them, and by the way, trauma are just severe examples of that. Trauma resolves because uh, we find that God was with us. Uh, he was not against us when this bad thing happened. Um, <clears throat> but really, uh, it can be a much smaller thing. You know, somebody cuts you off in traffic, you get in the slowest line in the grocery store <coughs> with a grumpy clerk, and all of a sudden, your connection to God and seeing other people as his children is lost. So if we had reviewed that together, and if our sermons were, were stories of how do we learn to see the world and each other and ourselves the way that God sees us, um, you know, in sort of a, the form that the brain will accept, which is a, a good example kind of story, um, which we can follow because we, you know, we feel connected to the person telling it, which by the way means we have to sort of have a connection with whoever it is who's preaching to us. Um, yeah. You know, they're not one of our people. And after age 12, your brain considers the survival of your people more important than your own survival. So it becomes our brain's reference group. Who are my people? And really, for most people, there's, uh, you know, the people that you see at church aren't your people. Maybe the people in your small group are. Uh, but why do most small groups fall apart after about two years when people's, you know, unhappy emotions come out? And it's, well, because, uh, you know, we have a, a fault self we brought to group and we all like each other's fault self until the flaws start showing through. And then we need a different group. Um, but what we actually need is somebody who can look at that and go, uh, you know, um, that's right where we need to see how God sees this moment in this place. Uh, you know, this is where we need best training and best learning of how to be the person God means us all to be. But that's a very different kind of environment than we typically see at church. Yeah. Wow. I've got, uh, I gotta, I gotta respect the time. So, I'm, I'm wrestling with this, and so this will be the short version, very short version from you, if you may. But it's, it's this idea that I lack the ability to be self-aware. And therefore, my awareness, if I'm picking up, again, what I'm reading, is that my awareness has to come from other people. Man, that's, uh, that's new for me. Help me out. Right. Well, the, the, your brain's identity center is not able to look at itself directly. I mean, I can't look at me and say, this is who I am. It's designed to look at other people and see who I am according to how, I, how they look at me. So uh, we're, we're basically, for the point, purpose of identity, we cannot look at ourselves and go, well, I really am something different than how other people see me. Uh, for the point of self-reflection and see how miserable do I feel, we can look at that. So whenever someone sees us in a way that doesn't match the way that God sees us, uh, it will leave us feeling miserable. We'll feel that all right. You know, like somebody says, you know, you're really pretty stupid and worthless. Uh, you know, we'll eventually believe we're stupid and worthless, but we won't be happy about it. Which and again goes we, into this whole idea that we we become the people of God, we are fundamentally adopted into a new family. As a result of that, we've got to bring to one another a reflection of an attachment that's different than that, than that one that our father had of us or Uncle Benny had of us or whoever that person is in, in our lives that has, or, or the ways that, you know, the kid on the bully at, at, on the playground at school or the bully that we were, and, and what the principal said of us, all that has to be reshaped into know you're a part of a new family. And again, the, the implications related to 
the covenant that Yahweh was making with the Old Testament people, this is just a continuation of that in the new covenant living. And uh, it's very, very exciting stuff. So, all right, you want to comment on that? And then I'll, I'll open it up uh, for some. Yeah, I think that comment was great. So I'll leave it there. And responses. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, if you will, I know we'll walk on each other and I can't get everybody up on the screen. So I'll just let you unmute yourself, and if you'll just um, sort of speak in, if I can recognize you, uh, or or if you want to raise your hand on the on the screen, who who has a question or a comment or is looking for a response from Dr. Jim? I do. If nobody. Can. Okay, John, come in here in the in the room. Okay, Jim, uh, you got three guys walk into your church. They all say they want to be discipled, and they want to be disciples of Jesus. you got a year with them, and one of the guys is going to be discipled the old way. The next guy is going to be discipled the way you're discovering might be best, and the other guy is going to be discipled, but he's been through trauma. Can you tell me the difference between those three people and what's going to happen that year? Um, right. Well, the, uh, let's say that the person going to be discipled the old way is, um, already got some, uh, leadership and other things going for them. Um, they will be taught the, uh, um, the right set of uh, beliefs. They'll me memorize scripture. They'll learn the principles that God wants them to operate by. They'll take them and have them work for them most of the time. And uh, the only problem is that when it comes to your initial response, the thing that, uh, uh, you know, how do you react to life? Uh, you will have to sort of suppress your initial responses. That is, you know, you'll still want to kick the dog. You'll still want to uh, uh, sound like a sailor when somebody cuts you off, but you'll know that isn't right. You'll, you'll, uh, and you'll slowly see that fade. Um, as something else grows. Now, if you disciple the second person who is also relatively intact, um, the new way, uh, you will be teaching them how do you um, share thoughts with God and how do you practice that with other people? So the question is, are you aware of God's presence right now? How does he see you and how does he see the situation and how do we share that with one another? Um, and it's a hard thing to learn because our brain is easily distracted by anything that uh, um, is going wrong. I mean, just looking at the screen here and seeing everybody move would be enough for me to lose track of God's presence half the time. Uh, you know, even your question on how do I listen to God could be enough to make me distracted. So I, the brain really has to learn uh, by lots of repetition uh, to notice when I'm disconnected with God and I'm just sort of freewheeling. Um, and that kind of practice um, has to happen in the context of a joyful relationship. What makes us glad to be together and uh, what, what builds a, a strong attachment with us. So uh, we took this, the appendix out of the uh, uh, renovated book and a group of us uh, from church have been practicing the 12 ways to form attachment. We practice one a month around the calendar. Within three months, the people there, most of them had been in church for, I'd say, an average of 50 years. So they had experienced more change in those three months than they could look at over the previous 50 years. So you would be talking about Here's my change in my character. My initial response is now becoming quite different than what it used to be. And then the final person who's traumatized, every time you ask them to get close to God, uh, they're going to have a bad reaction feel, uh, emotion wise. And so we're going to have to uh, teach them to build some peace and some connection with God um, by, uh, by just you know, learning what it like, is like to feel peaceful and quiet and just sit in God's presence without trying to do anything. 
before we can really move forward. So um, we'll be looking at, um, you know, kind of like you would, uh, uh, somebody's afraid of heights. How would, how would you take them up on a ladder? Well, the answer is not quickly. Um, <laughs> You, you would actually have to have them sit with the ladder for a while, get to know the ladder. The problem with ladders is they're really non-relational. The thing with Jesus is you sit with him and pretty soon he's pretty captivating. And as that grows, uh, you realize, um, oh, these other things are not as big as they felt before. It's, I'm not having to power past them. I'm just realizing, you know, Nothing high or low or big or scary is able to separate me from the loving attachment of Christ because, you know, not only will Christ's people not run away, but neither does he. And so you'd have a much slower process in a year. Uh, but you would all be becoming connected with Jesus and with each other. You realize at the end of the year, you know what? I think we've got a lifelong relationship started here. It was interesting to me that it took us 30 years of counseling to come up with techniques that resolved issues uh, in, you know, a matter of hours. And I said to Jesus one time in a prayer time, you know, why is it that it took us so long to discover these fast healing techniques? And he said, you know, healing is really quite easy for me to do. Forming relationships between my people takes a lot longer time. So I really couldn't heal any faster because you weren't forming a relationship quick enough. Um, and that seemed to be his priority. Wow. That's really good. Okay, someone else? Um, yeah, I've got a question, Rod. Yeah, please, Michael. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of trying to zoom in on the first that I had mentioned. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, uh, children that have uh, endured very traumatic experience, and to be and then step into adulthood. And so I guess what I'm asking is, uh, working with kids that have gone through trauma, uh, be it through the foster care system or wherever else, they have attachment disorders, or at least they're given the, identified as having an attachment disorder. And so how then uh, developing an attachment with a child or an adult that's grown from having a traumatic childhood that has an attachment disorder, are you saying that it's, it'd be a very similar process to working with someone that did not experience the trait, kind of a different shift and a different focus in there? Did you get that, Jim? Uh, I think I, at the end, uh, pieced together that if you're dealing with children with attachment disorders, uh, will it be a different process or a similar kind of process? And this um, pastor also uh, fosters kids, and they have a passion in their church about fostering. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Um, so the um, uh, there, there's sort of two things that uh, I usually say about this. One is that uh, I don't teach a whole lot about how to deal with attachment disorders because most people who take a teaching about attachment disorder and try to apply it will actually misapply it. You cannot you fix attachment in order to fix a child. And so if you approach it from the point of view of uh, I'm going to fix you uh, in some way, uh, you all already are wrecking the attachment because uh, attachments exist for no purpose at all. Uh, they attach, you know, uh, they serve lots of purposes, but they don't exist to serve a purpose. So the, the idea is, if I'm with you, I am going to reflect Jesus' face to you. I'm going to 
express his presence to you. And I'm going to use me as a, as a real lousy model of how God sees you. Um, and I'm going to admit that I'm a pretty lousy model and I'm not nearly as, as durable as Jesus is, but I'm going to help you see yourself and the people that God put in your life the way that Jesus does. Once you do that, um, it, the only question is going to be, are you going to be able to, hold, to be connected with Jesus strongly enough yourself that when the kid blows up, uh, you'll still stay connected with Jesus? So it's really a question of how well am I learning to stay connected with Jesus so I can be his presence in his face when other people become non-relational. If that's your context with children, um, then it's going to do them a lot of good. And one of the things we found, for instance, when we were dealing with children whose parents were actually Satanists uh, and doing some pretty horrible things was that although we couldn't get them out of that, the mess, as children, which is often the case with the uh, whole foster care system, we can teach them that in the future, there is a different possibility. There's a whole new model of what life could be like. And you may not be able to actually do much about it till you're over 18. But let's give you a model of what could be possible and what God sees um, in you. And those would just be, you know, you you just asked the, uh, you know, the, the toughest of all, the mother of all tough questions. And so in a short answer, I'll give you, a, uh, you know, <laughs> not a lot to hold on to, but that's, that's where I'd start. But, in, but what I hear you saying is, is that we always have the opportunity to provide for whatever season it is, is to continue to represent Jesus by staying attached or to not shut our relational circuits down, um, to not make them the enemy, et cetera, et cetera, to be conscious of that through exercises of breathing, through gratitude, through presence, inviting the healing of Jesus. And even if they only experience that for a short time, it's still a critical time because it's heaven, it might say heaven coming to earth in ways it hasn't previously for them. Yeah, uh, the good news about it, especially is if you do it under age 12, they will uh, retain three times more of their relational brain circuits uh, during the brain's uh, apoptotic period than if they didn't have it. So mm -hmm. their brain will save much more of its relational capacity just to have that exposure under age, tw uh, under age 12 than you know, regardless of what else happens in their life. So you can be saving their relational capacity, even though there's no way of really seeing it at the time. And again, I, what I'm hearing is this sort of more complete picture when we were talking earlier about um, if, if choice is on the one side, hey, I've decided to curriculum content, etc., and then uh, the work with uh, sort of figuring out the faculties and the spiritual disciplines is on the other side. This is sort of bridging the gap to say, I want to work at a pace that keeps me attached to Jesus, attached to the enemies within me to love myself, attached to my relationships, etc. And now my practice, in other words, there's motivation to do the practices, because why would I want to live in a way that is that is that continue to be traumatized um, by my past. In other words, I'm I'm victimized but not a victim. And so so I'm motivated to new practices in order to stay that relationally attached to Jesus, myself and one another. It's pretty uh, pretty cool stuff. You know one of the just mechanical exercises we used to give people um, was to give everybody a glass of water. And then uh, we would have them each uh, pour the water into somebody else's mouth while they drink it. Uh, and you realize very quickly, if you pour it too fast, you got a mess coming your way. Uh, part of what we learn to do with people who are in pain is to not pour the water in faster than they can drink it. Um, but 
uh, we help them connect with Jesus, who is an ongoing day, every day, all 24 hours a day source of life. Uh, and we're just giving a small cup of water on his behalf to people who are thirsty. Uh, but we don't pour it down their throat faster than they can drink it. I think that's a, a good image to keep in mind when, when dealing with hurt people. Tim, if you would introduce uh, Michael Sullivan, um, and I'll just simply say that there's a movement and a network. I know several of those, and Michael represents one with the Ministry of Life Works. There's also a connection that you have with Marcus Warner and the Ministry of uh, Deeper Walk. Um, and then, of course, uh, the work that you're doing yourself. But you're really hoping your legacy is, is that there'll be multiple applications of the benefits of neural theology and an extension of uh, Dallas's work by us having greater levels of awareness of about attachment. But describe Michael, if you will. He's over in Kansas City, and we hope to have him to central Missouri at, uh, at, in the near future uh, to build further relationships with those of us who, who are interested. Well, in fact, uh, what I might say about Michael and Life Model Works is that if uh, we are preaching a relational gospel uh, where God is building a people and permanent relationships, then Michael is trying to position himself uh, with God's help right in uh, the, the middle of a network of people who are forming relationships who want to learn how does the brain learn to do better relationships. And uh, help us to share what we're learning and uh, to uh, practice what the neuroscience that we have learned thus far and uh, create new applications for it. And so um, he is the director of those kind of relational networks. So everybody that wants to connect with him, you've found the person who is looking to connect with you. Um, so with that, um, yeah, Michael, if you would, uh, a little introduction uh, to the group, and then also uh, thank you for your resources, and uh, particularly this paper. I don't know if I can make that available to others. I'd be happy to send that link, but I found this, uh, uh, the life model simply explained to be very helpful, um, so thank you for that. Okay. Really gave me a nice handle. And then finally, uh, a little bit about the upcoming opportunity that you sent me the link on. Sure. Thank you so much, Rod, for the invitation to sit in with you today. Um, the first thing I want to say is just that my heart rejoices in the learning community that you all have created. I think that is, uh, you know, it just speaks a lot. There's a lot of words that could be said about what you've been doing, because here you are doing this amazing thing. So um, I, I just want to commend you all for your your passion to grow and learn and be together like you are. Um, I, I also just want to say that I'm grateful to be with my colleague, Jim Wilder today, who I've learned so much from and enjoy working with. He always, he always challenges me from new angles. It's like, Oh, I didn't even know that angle existed until he said that <laughs> it, it's a wonderful stimulus for my growth. Um, and, um, you know, a couple of things I just thought about as I was listening to the conversation was just the importance of our attachment center. And it's, it's been located by the neuroscientists in the deep part of our right hemisphere. And it, it's so basic, you know, to our whole life. And attachment is the most powerful force in the human brain. And Jim has asked this question, would God bypass using the attachment center to make us like Christ, or would he use it to make us like Christ? And the answer is, of course, he would use it to make us like Christ because he designed it. So I think of the life model as uh, discipleship by design, and it's, it's more human friendly because of that. So it works better because it's according to the way God has designed us. And I think it's just awesome that modern neuroscience is confirming ancient biblical wisdom, saying that relationships are central to our lives, relationship with God, relationship with other people. Uh, I think that's just amazing. And, the, and just another thing about the attachment center is, is, is we will make attachments. You know, human beings will make attachments. So the question is, will we let something uh, second best or fourth best or 10th best hijack our attachment center? Or will we 
submit our attachment center to God for his design for our relationship with him to make that a priority and to, uh, and to build healthy attachments rather than let the unhealthy attachments happen in our lives. Yeah. So it's, it's a, a challenge to reclaim, you know, that attachment center of our being for the glory of the Lord. And uh, the way that unhealthy atta- attachments lose their power is by they get eclipsed by the presence of God and the presence of uh, his people, our people. And then that's an expanding circle of people because God loves everybody and, and we're called to love everybody in his, in his name. Um, another thought I had was that uh, the whole thing about our identity coming from others, uh, I think it's a very powerful thought, but it's, it's really true. We've never even seen our own face directly. So it's just a great uh, you know, image or, uh, or a word picture for how we need uh, our, our true identity to be reflected back to us by God and by other people. Uh, it's just the way it works. Yeah. And uh, a lot of American people don't know who their people are. And uh, our, our society has become so fragmented and individualized. Uh, we need to, we need to uh, really, really work on uh, this whole effort to who are my people? You know, where's my tribe? Without falling into tribalism. Uh, and superiority kind of problems, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, the the other word I'm thinking of as as I'm listening is presencing. I've turned it into a verb. We need God to presence us, and then we need to presence one another uh, on God's behalf. And I and it's just so different than the information society. And I think this is where the church world has really fallen down. Is we've we've uh, equated discipleship with passing on information rather than imparting presence that's Mm. healthy and good. Good. Um, Share share about, if you would, we we do hold a 115 hard deadline. So uh, share about the LifeWorks resources and then for the upcoming seminar. I'm going to post a link right now in the chat window. So there's the link for um, the upcoming seminar that Jim is going to teach. So this is a great opportunity to um, follow up and get a, a good a four and a half hour seminar. It's in four it's in four blocks plus a discussion at the end with a panel of experts in their field. And so so we've called this group together, and uh, it's going to be on October the tenth. It's fifty dollars a seat, and uh, it's a great opportunity to follow up on the little appetizer we've gotten today. So enough said. That's great. Thank uh, you. Let me just mention briefly that uh, Dr. Bill Bjorker, who you mentioned earlier with the uh, oral um, hermeneutics, yeah. hermeneutics, he's going to be one of our people in the discussion panel. Uh, Beth Borum has written several books on spiritual formation. Dr. Bernard Franklin, uh, professor, and uh, 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 Dr. Bill Watson, who's uh, um, um, expert on uh, some of the uh, older practices in spiritual formation, and Bishop uh, Bill um, Bill Atwood, um, who's an Anglican uh, bishop and working in I think 15 countries uh, to bring. He's already written three books on how neuroscience applies to the Christian life. Uh, uh, he, they will all be discussing this with us, so you get a lot of perspective. And I, I think it'll be a great time on the four speeds that the brain thinks. I've got a feeling that uh, if uh, Michael is willing to work with me, that if there's enough interest, that we can make that available here in CEI, and we'll we'll give a, a generous donation, but so that uh, we can make that affordable. Absolutely, so, Jensen. That you got to be sure be sure and let me know. Um, let's talk about these books. The first one is Renovated, God, Dallas Willard, and the Church that Transforms. But I don't necessarily know what order these ought to go in. Um, and then the other half of church is the application to discipleship and, and ministry in particular, uh, Jim. But, um, but I also really appreciated Michael's sort of, you know, life model works explained. And then you've got the whole joy attachment piece too. So 
Uh, yeah, kind of help us, like, um, where should we start? Because right now the movement is sort of making its application in various ways, but some of us really need the sort of 101 core book, which, and then you've got the application to narcissism and loving the, called the Pandora's problem, which my wife, uh, Julie, is, is digesting right now and doing Barbara's uh, webinar with her. So all of it's got, what, what are your thoughts and which resources would you recommend? Well, let uh, me just say that you're very free to pass that paper on far and wide. I'll do that. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll ship that out to, to the uh, brown bag group, as I call them. Go ahead, Jim. Right, so uh, probably people who are just looking to connect with Jesus would probably like the Joyful Journey uh, book, uh, which is uh, here's how we, we enter into mutual mind with God and, and train each other with it. If you're trying to help a community, there is the uh, a little booklet called Passing the Peace, which is how do we live in peace and help other people to learn it. Um, that's a really good resource. Uh, if you are one of those people who need to be convinced theoretically that you know this is um, solid, then uh, Renovated is the book to start with. It's the most theoretical, and it'll. Uh, address more of your theological problems. So I will mention that that book, like every other chapter, is Dallas's presentation at the conference, and then you interact with it. So it creates mm -hmm. a dialogue between you and him. Yeah, and then the solution of choice with Marcus Warner uh, is um, a good uh, source if you want to look at volunteerism. And then finally, there is rare leadership. Uh, if you're just trying to look at how do I look at this as a as a leader, then Marcus uh, Warner and I did that book on rare leadership, and uh, he reduced all of this to four different principles. Uh, yeah, he's very good at reducing things to simplicity. So, uh, very good. All right, now for everybody who's listening, I uh, if you go to uh, Theological Education Initiative YouTube channel then I hope to have this posted by the end of the day. Um, so we did hit record and all those kinds of things. So if you would like to watch it or send it, or for those who couldn't make it, uh, we'll have it there on our YouTube channel, Theological Education Initiative. Also, uh, teimissouri.org is also there. So uh, we give everything away for free, but that means that uh, those who can, everybody does their part. So you can become a monthly uh, contributor as some of you are already. So thank you for that. And for the churches that helped to make this TEI happen. Grateful for all of that. Jim, you've been a great uh, guest today. Excited to continue this relationship, uh, et cetera. And, um, and Michael, thank you. Look forward to having you. You have a sister-in-law who lives here and some of us know Mal Mays, uh, uh -huh. a, a local attorney. And so that's your sister. So you get to Columbia and, and post COVID. Uh, we want to host you here at uh, TEI for sure. So final word from you, uh, Dr. Jim, anything? Well, if you look up, you will notice that God's face is smiling your direction. So may bless you, keep you, make his countenance to shine upon you and give you peace. Well said. Now I do leave the uh, room open. You can unmute yourself. It's sort of chaos. And then as you, uh, Dr. Jim, want to stick around and excuse yourself either way, but I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave the room open, and y'all can talk to each other in the chaos of that for a bit, and then everybody can just sort of say goodbye at uh, at will. So, but anyway, we're out, and blessings everybody, and uh, thank you again, Dr. Jim, Michael. Appreciate you guys. Keep the faith. Dr. Jim, can you hear me?